raped and killed at 17, walking through a park. Molested since the age of five by a family friend. Raped and killed at the age of 22, walking home. Sexually harassed at work every day. Raped with a metal rod and then tossed onto the side of a road. Raped at 19 and the judge asked her why she didn't shut her knees together. I could not name all these women, these thousands of women, because their stories have bled to become a line on a graph, a number in a data table, a percentage we highlight and underline in red and show it to our girls and tell them this is why we teach you to be safe. But what I can tell you is that the reason that these stories are happening all around the world every day is because of a rape culture that we are a part of. And today I'll be discussing how sexual violence and rape and the rape culture is influenced by gender and feminism. In the dictionary, rape culture is defined as a society or environment whose prevailing social attitudes have the effect of normalizing sexual assault or abuse. Now many people dispute that a rape culture even exists, especially in Western countries, but to do so I think is very ignorant and often comes from a position of power or privilege. Because rape culture isn't pointing at every man and saying, you are a monster who is going to sexually assault a woman at some point in your life because you're a man. Rape culture isn't saying that we as a society are pro-rape. Rape culture is looking deeper, asking why. Why are women the huge majority of victims of sexual assault? Why are men the overwhelming majority of perpetrators of sexual assault? Why does rape and sexual assault even occur in such massive proportions in our society in the first place? Because although we only hear about the occasional Jill Maher or Eurydice Dixon, sexual assault is happening all the time everywhere and these statistics are not coincidental. And so rape culture aims to examine how we as a society have contributed to the normalization of sexual violence. There are so many factors that influence a rape culture um, and sexual violence. Your race, your socioeconomic class, the legal system, your age, the country you live in, and so on. But today I'll be exploring how gender and feminism um, do this. Gender is an obvious influencer. Since the age of 15, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence in Australia compared to one in 20 men. That is a significant difference in proportion. And feminism. Feminism on its own is a theory that both sexes should have equal rights politically, socially, economically and legally. But intersectionality comes into it when we look at how oppression intersects, such as people who don't benefit from from a patriarchal society, but also a white one. For example, a coloured um, woman and a white woman would have different experience of, experiences of daily oppression because of the intersection of racism and sexism. Now, many people love to tell me, as a feminist, that my, what I believe in excludes men, that feminism is um, all about women. I, you know, I've had multiple experiences where I've tried to engage about conversations about the struggles and the hardships that women face on a daily basis, only to have people interrupt me and tell me that male suicide rates are higher, and that men face sexual assault too, and that men face problems and feminism just focuses on women, so they've decided they're going to be an equalist. And I agree with parts of that. Men face problems. But what I never get a chance to finish saying is that the reason that these men face these problems is because of the ongoing oppression against women. What do I mean? Well, we can all agree that we live in a patriarchal society, um, a system of power where men are largely in control and women are excluded. And we see this across all domains, um, in work and at home. Um, we live in a society where gender is a pervasive social construct and we know exactly what it means to be a boy and exactly what it means to be a girl. It's a society where traits like intelligence, strength, determination are all associated with masculinity and traits like being delicate, 
vain, manipulative, emotional, are all associated with femininity. It's ingrained in men that being emotional, being vulnerable, expressing their feelings are all feminine qualities. And what are feminine qualities? Bad. Women are weak. That is what we refer to as toxic masculinity. And so, yes, men feel pressure to be the breadwinner, to be strong, to be dependable, to never cry, to man up. But if women weren't expected to be reliant, then men wouldn't feel the need to provide. If being like a girl wasn't associated with weakness, then being tough wouldn't automatically be associated with masculinity. If women weren't forced into maternal positions, then men wouldn't feel the need to act stoic and uncaring. From birth, violence and anger is taught as manly, and manly is seen as better. The beginning of a rape culture. So yes, males are sexually assaulted. Yes, their experiences are valid and important and should be talked about. But we have to acknowledge three things. First, saying males get raped too is often used to derail conversations about female experiences. I agree that men's issues should be heard and talked about, but don't use it as a comeback. Two, a large proportion of sexual assaults against men are committed by men themselves which brings us back to the original problem of male violence. Three, because of stigma, men often don't come forward about their sexual assault experiences because they fear being ostracized, being humiliated, being not believed, being laughed at. But think about where that stigma comes from. It comes from ideals that men are supposed to enjoy sex, that men are strong, that girls can be raped because they're weak and they need protection. So acknowledging that a rape culture exists doesn't mean that you say all men are bad, all men are violent, all men are rapists. All it means is that you acknowledge that men have grown up in a society which favours them and demeans women at the same time. And we've all had these harmful beliefs and sexist attitudes normalized for us to one degree or another and we've all expressed them to one degree or another and yes this has repercussions for both the sexes but women face these repercussions more severely more intensely and more frequently now you might be thinking when when do we teach men that violence against women is okay why are we blaming this idea of a rape culture rather than the individuals who commit horrific crimes? The thing is though, more than four in 10 Australians believe that rape results because a man can't control his need for sex. And nearly one in five believe that if a woman was at least um, was drunk or affected by drugs at the time of a rape, then she was partly responsible for it. And these kind of harmful beliefs aren't something that we are inherently born with or originate within us. We learn externally. Maybe it's through our legal system, which historically considered um, sexual assault cases as property offences. That is, women were the property of their husband or their father. And that is still so lenient about sexual assault cases. As the rest of the world looks on in horror, as Brock Turner received only three months of jail time for raping an unconscious woman behind a dumpster in the USA. Remember that Douglas Steele received only 17 weeks jail time for raping an indigenous woman in Queensland, Australia. 17 weeks, less than a semester of school. Or maybe we learn it through our entertainment industry where movies sell us the same narrative of the sex crazed playboy jock and the shy, quiet, good girl virgin, or that paint women as shallow and dumb, or that depict non consensual actions as sexy or commanding. Or maybe it's through our sexually violent language. It starts off with a sexist joke, yes, but no one says anything, so then it escalates. Rape joke, less laughs, but still, no one says anything. Cat calls, funny. Victim blaming? Yeah. Why was she wearing that if she wasn't asking for it? Groping? Couldn't help it. Coercion? Technically, she didn't say no, right? 
Revenge porn, drugging, rape. Oh, and then we seem to care. And if you think that's far-fetched, then I ask you, why is it one in three? Ultimately, sexual assault is about power. Sure, some element of deranged sex sexual satisfaction may play a part, but it boils down to holding someone against their will, whether that be emotionally or physically, and exercising your power over them. And that power comes from years of ingrained ideals that men are powerful and men are strong and men are uncontrollable animals who need sex. I'm sure you all heard about a woman named Jill Maher. She was brutally raped and murdered a few years ago here in Melbourne. Her death was a catalyst for public outcry because it was the perfect example of what we think sexual assault and rape is. It was at night, it was by a stranger, it was in an alleyway, it was random. But the same power that allows a man to feel as though he can do that is the same power that allows a man to feel unashamed to ogle a woman in public or grab a butt at the train station or sexually harass her at work. It's taught men through years of movies and books and our attitudes and advertisements that it's okay to be so turned on by a beautiful woman that you can just slam her against a brick wall and take her as you like because that is just so hot and dominant and sexy. Feminism, however, has been crucial to understanding all of this. In fact, in Australia, sexual assault was just considered to be rape. But it was feminists who outraged against this and demanded for it to classify other forms of sex sexual assault as well. Feminists who have recognized that toxic masculinity and victim blaming are two prominent features of a rape culture. Feminists who have urged women to come forward and talk about their experiences rather than letting it be swept under the rug. Without feminism, rape culture would never have been explored so thoroughly. Without feminism, all those tiny instances of sexism and discrimination would never even have been looked at as contributing factors to a rape culture. And that is why now, moving into the future, we need to act. We need to do something even if it is just starting conversation, because it's precisely conversation that means that you acknowledge something is wrong, that you don't accept what's happening in the world, that you don't stay silent. To all the women in here, one in three. And that is why this presentation isn't black and white for me. It's twisted up in the terrifying reality of being a girl and having to think about this stuff every day of having to see girls everywhere suffering and struggling and sometimes having the immense bravery to face their abuser in court only to be attacked for not being the perfect virgin victim. So if there's one thing you take away from today, it would be to notice. Notice how you and I contribute to a rape culture. Recognize that when a girl walks by or posts a picture wearing a short dress or a lot of makeup and we gossip and say, why is she looking for so much attention? Why is she trying so hard? Why is she such a slut? Recognize that you just accepted every ra excuse a rapist makes, which is that she asked for it with the way she dressed. Notice that schools have modest skirt lengths as if the length of a skirt determines how worthy respect we are or correlates to how we learn. Notice that we consume material made by misogynistic men that emphasizes again and again how women are whores and women are gold diggers and women are sluts and we think it's just a song but don't realize this is what this is exactly what reinforces those behaviors and ideas to all the young men listening think about yourself do you identify as a feminist if you don't because you think the word is exclusive towards men then I urge you to think about what I've told you today. It has been women who have been fundamentally and systematically oppressed for centuries, legally, socially, economically, politically. So why can't the word pay respect to that? Why can't the word acknowledge that? Or if it's because you think feminism doesn't include all women or is, or is too extreme, then I urge you to um, 
uh, try proper research, especially because modern feminism has placed the most importance on being accepting of all women. I am immensely proud of the steps we've taken with the Me Too, hashtag Me Too movement. It breaks my heart to see what women face on a daily basis, but it warms it too to see that we are finally paying attention. But this is only the beginning and we have a long way to go. So be aware, be aware and most of all, be angry because nothing ever changed with people being sad, but things have changed with people being angry because we have a right to be angry with the messed up, excruciating reality of being a woman in this world and having to worry about every move we make lest we be sexually assaulted and it's all our fault for wearing that dress, talking to that boy, going to that party, drinking that beer, um, not carrying pepper spray, not explicitly saying no, not fighting back hard enough, not being modest, not covering up, not being ladylike, not being skinny, not being curvy, not conforming to every single rule that's been made for a woman written in a book by a man. Read up about feminism and the word and the idea before you dismiss it, because it's better to be that annoying feminist girl than to be silent or than to be complicit. Be aware of the power that you hold. And most of all, be angry. Thank you.